ปันที่สุดในการพัฒนาชีวิตของเด็กเป็นช่วงวัยของการสร้างรากฐานสำหรับการเติบโตและการเรียนรู้ต่อไปในชีวิตและภารกิจที่7สุดท้ายกรอบคุณวุฒิแห่งชาติเชื่อมโยงคุณวุฒิการศึกษากับมาตรฐานอาชีพไว้ด้วยกันโดยยกระดับความรู้ความสามารถและคุณวุฒิทางการศึกษารองรับการจ้างงานในอนาคตที่หลากหลายเพื่อส่งเสริมการเรียนรู้ตลอดชีวิตและเพิ่มโอกาสทางการศึกษาด้วยภารกิจทั้งหมดเหล่านี้ทําให้สํานักงานเลขาธิการสภาการศึกษาองค์กรหลักที่กำหนดนโยบายการศึกษาของชาติเพื่อพัฒนาทรัพยากรมนุษย์และนวัตกรรมทางการศึกษามุ่งสู่ความเป็นเลิศในเวทีโลกเปิดโลกดิจิตอลสู่การเรียนรู้อย่างไร้ขีดจำกัดไปกับน้องพาเพลินด้วย5ช่องทางการติดตามที่ OEC News พาการศึกษา Facebook Fanpage OEC News พากันศึกษาช่องทางที่ชาวโซเชียลไม่ควรพลาดน้องพักเพลินรับรองได้เลยว่า Fanpage OEC News พากันศึกษาที่มีตกแท้แน่นอน Line Official Account เห็นแค่พิมพ์แอด OEC News ในมีช่องคนหาและกดเพิ่มเพื่อนน้องพักเพลินจะคอยอัปเดตข่าวสารส่งเตือนถึงเงินชักไว้ทางเหตุการณ์บูก้าเวิลด์คือความท้าทายของโลกสมัยใหม่ภายใต้สถานการณ์ที่มีการเปลี่ยนแปลงรวดเร็วจุดเปลี่ยนสำคัญของระบบการศึกษาจึงต้องสร้างคนรุ่นใหม่ที่กล้าจะเปลี่ยนแปลงไปสู่สิ่งใหม่ๆสภาการศึกษายกระดับบทบาทเป็นเข็มทิศการศึกษาชาติกำหนดเป้าหมายอนาคตเด็กไทย2025เพื่อเศรษฐกิจไทยสภาการศึกษาขับเคลื่อนพิมพ์เขียวการสร้างกำลังคนหรือ Skill Mapping กำหนดทิศทางการศึกษาและการพัฒนากำลังคนของประเทศให้มีสมรรถนะสูงและสอดคล้องกับเศรษฐกิจใหม่มีเส้นทางชีวิตชัดเจนในทุกช่วงวัยโดยยึดโยงกับ5กลุ่มอุตสาหกรรมเป้าหมายประกอบด้วย 1. กลุ่มดิจิทัลแห่งอนาคต 2. กลุ่มธุรกิจบริการการท่องเที่ยวโรงแรม 3. กลุ่มระบบขนส่งและโลจิสติกส์ 4. กลุ่มเกษตรอัจฉริยะและ5กลุ่มหุ่นยนต์และระบบอัตโนมัติเพื่อการบรรลุเป้าหมายพัฒนาประเทศระบบการศึกษาจำเป็นต้องเร่งปรับเปลี่ยนการผลิตและพัฒนาคนในทุกเจเนอเรชันให้มีสมรรถนะสูงด้วยการพัฒนาระบบเทียบโอนความรู้และประสบการณ์ที่ชัดเจนและเปิดโอกาสให้ภาคเอกชนมีส่วนร่วมวางหลักสูตรรองรับการพัฒนาทักษะของคนทุกกลุ่มกลุ่มคนเจเนอเรชัน X มีประมาณ16ล้าน4แสนคนกำลังเข้าสู่วัยเกษียณแต่ก็ยังต้องแบบภาระครอบครัวอยู่ส่วนเจเนอเรชัน Y มีอยู่15ล้าน1แสนคนอยู่ในวัยทำงานและมีค่าใช้จ่ายที่เพิ่มขึ้นเรื่อยๆและเจเนอเรชัน C ซึ่งเป็นกลุ่มคนคลื่นลูกใหม่ที่มีทักษะการทำงานหลายอย่างมีประมาณ12ล้าน9แสนคนสิ่งที่ต้องทาต่อเนื่องคือการออกแบบระบบการศึกษาเชิงพื้นที่ให้มีความเข้มแข็งควบคู่กันไปด้วยและต้องประมาณการความต้องการแรงงานในอนาคตและทักษะที่จำเป็นความต้องการแรงงานทักษะแห่งอนาคตหรือ Future Skill ของประเทศไทยในอีก3ปีข้างหน้าอุตสาหกรรมเป้าหมายอย่างกลุ่มดิจิทัลยังเปิดกว้างต้องการ Data Scientist หรือ Full Stack Developer มากถึง 30,000 อัตรากลุ่มการบินและโลจิสติกส์ยังเปิดกว้างในตำแหน่ง Ground Service Officer หรือ Logistics Data Specialist มากกว่า 29,000 อัตราและยังต้องการ 15,000 ตำแหน่งในกลุ่มการท่องเที่ยวรายได้สูงเชิงสุขภาพกับงานดิจิทัล Marketing Specialist ภายใต้ทิศทางที่มีเป้าหมายการพัฒนากำลังคนตามนโยบายรัฐบาลเข็มทิศสภาการศึกษาพัฒนาประเทศไทยประเทศมีความหวังคนไทยมีเส้นทางการศึกษาที่ชัดเจนด้วย Skill Mapping เลือกเรียนที่ชอบเพื่อจะได้ทำงานที่ใช่สำหรับตนเองเพราะทุกเจเนอเรชันคือกำลังสำคัญของการพัฒนาประเทศ
ขอต้อนรับเข้าสู่สำนักงานเลขาธิการสภาการศึกษาเราเป็นหนึ่งในองค์กรสำคัญของกระทรวงศึกษาธิการซึ่งทำหน้าที่ในการกำหนดทิศทางและนโยบายด้านการศึกษาของชาติพัฒนานโยบายและประสานการนำนโยบายไปสู่การปฏิบัติให้สอดคล้องกับแผนการศึกษาแห่งชาติโดยมีภารกิจหน้าที่ต่างๆดึงต่อไปนี้ตามมาดูกันภารกิจแรกนโยบายและแผนการศึกษาจัดทำแผนการศึกษาแห่งชาติที่บูรณาการศาสนาศิลปะวัฒนธรรมและกีฬากับการศึกษาทุกระดับด้วยการลงพื้นที่ทำความคิดเห็นทั่วประเทศเรารวบรวมจัดทำข้อเสนอนโยบายและแผนในการสนับสนุนทรัพยากรด้านการศึกษาของชาติไปภารกิจต่อไปกันภารกิจที่2มาตรฐานการศึกษาและพัฒนาการเรียนรู้ประสานการจัดทำข้อเสนอนโยบายแผนและมาตรฐานการศึกษาของชาติจึงกลายเป็นคนสมบัติที่เป็นผู้เรียนรู้ผู้ร่วมสร้างสรรค์นวัตกรรมและพลเมืองที่แข้มแข็งและภารกิจต่อไปคืออะไรไปดูกันภารกิจที่3วิจัยและพัฒนาการศึกษาวิจัยและประสานส่งเสริมสนับสนุนการวิจัยและพัฒนาการศึกษาการพัฒนาเครือข่ายการเรียนรู้และภูมิปัญญาของชาติตลอดจนรวบรวมและพัฒนาระบบเครือข่ายข้อมูลสารสนเทศเพื่อการพัฒนานโยบายและแผนการศึกษาของชาตินั่นเองภารกิจที่4ประเมินผลการจัดการศึกษารับฟังความคิดเห็นเพื่อประเมินผลการจัดการศึกษาตามแผนการศึกษาแห่งชาติภารกิจที่5กฎหมายการศึกษาให้ความเห็นหรือคำแนะนำในเรื่องกฎหมายที่เกี่ยวกับการศึกษาตามแผนปฏิรูปประเทศด้านการศึกษาเสนอเพื่อพิจารณาบังคับใช้ต่อไปภารกิจที่6พัฒนาเด็กปฐมวัยสร้างมาตรฐานการพัฒนาเด็กปฐมวัยหรือวัยอนุบาลช่วงขวบปีแรกๆที่สําคัญที่สุดในการพัฒนาชีวิตของเด็กเป็นช่วงวัยของการสร้างรากฐานสําหรับการเติบโตและการเรียนรู้ต่อไปในชีวิตและภารกิจที่7สุดท้ายกรอบคุณวุฒิแห่งชาติเชื่อมโยงคุณวุฒิการศึกษากับมาตรฐานอาชีพไว้ด้วยกันโดยยกระดับความรู้ความสามารถและคุณวุฒิทางการศึกษารองรับการจ้างงานในอนาคตที่หลากหลายเพื่อส่งเสริมการเรียนรู้ตลอดชีวิตและเพิ่มโอกาสทางการศึกษาด้วยภารกิจทั้งหมดเหล่านี้ทำให้สำนักงานเลขาธิการสภาการศึกษาเป็นองค์กรหลักที่กำหนดนโยบายการศึกษาของชาติเพื่อพัฒนาทรัพยากรมนุษย์และนวัตกรรมทางการศึกษามุ่งสู่ความเป็นเลิศในเวทีโลก Digital, สู่การเรียนรู้อย่างไร้ขีดจำกัดไปกับน้องพาเพลินด้วย5ช่องทางการติดตามที่ OEC News พาการศึกษา Facebook Fanpage OEC News พาการศึกษาช่องทางที่ชาวโซเชียลไม่ควรพลาดน้องพาเพลินรับรองได้เลยว่า Fanpage OEC News พาการศึกษาที่มีตกแท่งแน่นอนชื่อแอปเขาเพียงแค่พิมพ์แอปโอเอซีนิวส์ในช่องคนหาและกดเพิ่มเพื่อนบางทางคุณจะคอยอัปเดตข่าวสารส่งตัวถึงเงินชักไว้ทันเหตุการณ์ YouTube c h anel โอเอซีนิวส์พาการศึกษาทำความรู้ออนไลน์ในรูปแบบวิดีโอพร้อมอัปเดตเรื่องราวทางการศึกษาที่ทำพร้อมทั้งความถูกและเข้าใจง่ายเหมือนเพื่อนเพื่อนยังสามารถรับชมตอนหลังได้ทุกที่ทุกเวลาด้วยนะคะล็อกติโอีซีนิวส์พาการศึกษาช่องทางน้องใหม่ที่อยากให้ลองพื้นที่ใช้บทความและแนวที่ใต้ของสภาการศึกษาแนวสาขาแบ่งปันองค์ความรู้ไปกับน้องทางเดินไซต์ www.oec.go.th ศูนย์กลางข่าวสารที่สภาการศึกษาและน้องทางเดินได้ร่วมมือกันให้เพื่อนๆทั้งเรื่องราวสำคัญและประเด็นเด่นทางด้านการศึกษาที่น่าสนใจเข้าถึงข้อมูลข่าวสารได้ง่ายและทันทุกเรื่องราวอย่ารอช้ามาท่องโลกแห่งการเรียนรู้ไปพร้อมกันกับน้องพาเพลินคลิกเลยเรื่องราวทางการศึกษาพร้อมส่งตรงถึงเพื่อนเพื่อนทุกคนแล้วเ
สวัสดีค่ะ As we move on and return to normalcy, we look forward to welcoming you to Thailand. To New Zealand 2021 APEC host, you have joined us together to overcome unprecedented challenges. ขอบคุณค่ะ The pandemic has revealed imbalances in the way we live, do business, and treat our planet. We must do better for a better future. Together, we can increase regional economic integration. And shape the world's future to build a more open, connected, and balanced world for future generations. We are an inclusive economy, open to trade and investment, open for business, open to new ideas, always evolving and ready for what's next. As one, we open. We are advancing digital economy, creating new platforms for growth, unlocking limitless potential. We are building an economy of trust and bringing people together across the Asia Pacific region and beyond. As one, we connect. We are striving for balanced prosperity for everyone and businesses of all sizes. Working to live in harmony with nature and optimize resources, Thailand is focusing on synergizing bio, circular, and green economy, shifting to renewable energy and innovations for sustainable food systems, cutting emissions, and efficiently managing our waste. As one, we balance. On the road ahead, many challenges await. We must do it together to build a balanced and sustainable ecosystem for future generations that leaves no one behind. APEC has proven resilient and overcome enormous challenges. We have a Thai saying which captures the spirit of our cooperation. Nam n i n g a i d i o k a n across the ocean, united as one. As one, we can create a brighter future. Effect 2022. See you soon. กาเวิลคือความท้าทายของโลกสมัยใหม่ภายใต้สถานการณ์ที่มีการเปลี่ยนแปลงรวดเร็วจุดเปลี่ยนสำคัญของระบบการศึกษาจึงต้องสร้างคนรุ่นใหม่ที่กล้าจะเปลี่ยนแปลงไปสู่สิ่งใหม่ๆสภาการศึกษายกระดับบทบาทเป็นเข็มพิษการศึกษาชาติกำหนดเป้าหมายอนาคตเด็กไทย2025เพื่อเศรษฐกิจไทยสภาการศึกษาขับเคลื่อนพิมพ์เขียวการสร้างกาลังคนหรือ Skill Mapping กำหนดทิศทางการศึกษาและการพัฒนากำลังคนของประเทศให้มีสมรรถนะสูงและสอดคล้องกับเศรษฐกิจใหม่มีเส้นทางชีวิตชัดเจนในทุกช่วงวัยโดยยึดโยงกับ5กลุ่มอุตสาหกรรมเป้าหมายประกอบด้วย 1. กลุ่มดิจิทัลแห่งอนาคต 2. กลุ่มธุรกิจบริการการท่องเที่ยวโรงแรม 3. กลุ่มระบบขนส่งและโลจิสติกส์ 4. กลุ่มเกษตรอัจฉริยะและ5กลุ่มหุ่นยนต์และระบบอัตโนมัติเพื่อการบรรลุเป้าหมายพัฒนาประเทศระบบการศึกษาจำเป็นต้องเร่งปรับเปลี่ยนการผลิตและพัฒนาคนในทุกเจเนอเรชันให้มีสมรรถนะสูงด้วยการพัฒนาระบบเทียบโอนความรู้และประสบการณ์ที่ชัดเจนและเปิดโอกาสให้ภาคเอกชนมีส่วนร่วมวางหลักสูตรรองรับการพัฒนาทักษะของคนทุกกลุ่มกลุ่มคนเจเนอเรชัน X 
มีประมาณ16ล้าน4แสนคนกำลังเข้าสู่วัยเกษียณแต่ก็ยังต้องแบบภาระครอบครัวอยู่ส่วนเจเนเรชันวายมีอยู่15ล้าน1แสนคนอยู่ในวัยทำงานและมีค่าใช้จ่ายที่เพิ่มขึ้นเรื่อยๆและเจเนเรชันสีซึ่งเป็นกลุ่มคนคลื่นลูกใหม่ที่มีทักษะการทำงานหลายอย่างมีประมาณ12ล้าน9แสนคนสิ่งที่ต้องทำต่อเนื่องคือการออกแบบระบบการศึกษาเชิงพื้นที่ให้มีความเข้มแข็งควบคู่กันไปด้วยและต้องประมาณการความต้องการแรงงานในอนาคตและทักษะที่จำเป็นความต้องการแรงงานทักษะแห่งอนาคตหรือ Future Skill ของประเทศไทยในอีก3ปีข้างหน้าอุตสาหากรรมเป้าหมายอย่างกลุ่มดิจิทัลยังเปิดกว้างต้องการ Data Scientist หรือ Full Stack Developer มากถึง 30,000 อัตรากลุ่มการบินและโลจิสติกยังเปิดกว้างในตำแหน่ง Ground Service Officer หรือ Logistics Data Specialist มากกว่า 29,000 อัตราและยังต้องการ 15,000 ตำแหน่งในกลุ่มการท่องเที่ยวรายได้สูงเชิงสุขภาพกับงานดิจิทัลมาร์เก็ตติ้งสเปเชียลิสต์ภายใต้ทิศทางที่มีเป้าหมายการพัฒนากำลังคนตามนโยบายรัฐบาลเข็มทิศสภาการศึกษาพัฒนาประเทศไทยประเทศมีความหวังคนไทยมีเส้นทางการศึกษาที่ชัดเจนด้วยสกิลแมปปิ้งเลือกเรียนที่ชอบเพื่อจะได้ทำงานที่ใช่สำหรับตนเองเพราะทุกเจเนเรชันคือกำลังสำคัญของการพัฒนาประเทศขอต้อนรับเข้าสู่สำนักงานเลขาธิการสภาการศึกษาเราเป็นหนึ่งในองค์กรสำคัญของกระทรวงศึกษาธิการซึ่งทำหน้าที่ในการกำหนดทิศทางและนโยบายด้านการศึกษาของชาติพัฒนานโยบายและประสานการนำนโยบายไปสู่การปฏิบัติให้สอดคล้องกับแผนการศึกษาแห่งชาติโดยมีภารกิจหน้าที่ต่างๆดึงต่อไปนี้ตามมาดูกันภารกิจแรกนโยบายและแผนการศึกษาจัดทำแผนการศึกษาแห่งชาติที่บูรณาการศาสนาศิลปะวัฒนธรรมและกีฬากับการศึกษาทุกระดับด้วยการลงพื้นที่ทำความคิดเห็นทั่วประเทศเรารวบรวมจัดทำข้อเสนอนโยบายและแผนในการสนับสนุนทรัพยากรด้านการศึกษาของชาติไปภารกิจต่อไปกันภารกิจที่2มาตรฐานการศึกษาและพัฒนาการเรียนรู้ประสานการจัดทำข้อเสนอนโยบายแผนและมาตรฐานการศึกษาของชาติจึงกลายเป็นคุณสมบัติที่เป็นผู้เรียนรู้ผู้ร่วมสร้างสรรค์นวัตกรรมและพลเมืองที่แข้มแข็งและภารกิจต่อไปคืออะไรไปดูกันภารกิจที่3วิจัยและพัฒนาการศึกษาวิจัยและประสานส่งเสริมสนับสนุนการวิจัยและพัฒนาการศึกษาการพัฒนาเครือข่ายการเรียนรู้และภูมิปัญญาของชาติตลาดจนรวบรวมและพัฒนาระบบเครือข่ายข้อมูลสารสนเทศเพื่อการพัฒนานโยบายและแผนการศึกษาของชาตินั่นเองภารกิจที่4ประเมินผลการจัดการศึกษารับฟังความคิดเห็นเพื่อประเมินผลการจัดการศึกษาตามแผนการศึกษาแห่งชาติภารกิจที่5กฎหมายการศึกษาให้ความเห็นหรือคำแนะนำในเรื่องกฎหมายที่เกี่ยวกับการศึกษาตามแผนปฏิรูปเกิดแทศด้านการศึกษาเสนอเพื่อพิจารณาบังคับใช้ต่อไปภารกิจที่6พัฒนาเด็กปฐมวัยสร้างมาตรฐานการพัฒนาเด็กปฐมวัยหรือวัยอนุบาลช่วงขวบปีแรกๆที่สำคัญที่สุดในการพัฒนาชีวิตของเด็กเป็นช่วงวัยของการสร้างรากฐานสำหรับการเติบโตและการเรียนรู้ต่อไปในชีวิตและภารกิจที่7สุดท้ายกรอบคุณวุฒิแห่งชาติ
ชื่อมโยงคุณวุฒิการศึกษากับมาตรฐานอาชีพไว้ด้วยกันโดยยกระดับความรู้ความสามารถและคุณวุฒิทางการศึกษารองรับการจ้างงานในอนาคตที่หลากหลายเพื่อส่งเสริมการเรียนรู้ตลอดชีวิตและเพิ่มโอกาสทางการศึกษาด้วยภารกิจทั้งหมดเหล่านี้ทำให้สำนักงานเลขาธิการสภาการศึกษาเป็นองค์กรหลักที่กำหนดนโยบายการศึกษาของชาติเพื่อพัฒนาทรัพยากรมนุษย์และนวัตกรรมทางการศึกษามุ่งสู่ความเป็นเลิศในเวทีโลกเปิดโลกดิจิตอลสู่การเรียนรู้อย่างไร้ขีดจำกัดไปกับน้องพาเพลินด้วยห้าช่องทางการติดตามที่ OEC News พาการศึกษา Facebook Fanpage OEC News พาการศึกษาช่องทางที่ชาวโซเชียลไม่ควรพลาดน้องพาเพลินรับรองได้เลยว่า Fanpage OEC News พาการศึกษาที่มีตกแทนแน่นอนชื่อแอปเขาเพียงแค่พิมพ์แอปโอทีซีนิวส์มีช่องค้นหาและกดเพิ่มเพื่อนต้องพาเพื่อนมาคอยอัปเดตเขาสาโฟโต้ทิ้งเงินชักไว้ทั้งเหตุการณ์ยูทูบช่องโอทีซีนิวส์พาการศึกษาทำความรู้ออนไลน์ในรูปแบบวิดีโอพร้อมอัปเดตเรื่องราวทางการศึกษาที่ทำพร้อมทั้งความถูกและเข้าใจง่ายเพื่อนเพื่อนยังสามารถรับชมตอนหลังได้ทุกที่ทุกเวลาด้วยนะคะล็อกติโอ e c ีนิวพาการศึกษาช่องทางน้องใหม่ที่อยากให้ลองพื้นที่สะดวกพร้อมและแรงที่ได้ผลพาการศึกษาแรงปรึกษาแรงปั้นองค์ความรู้ไปกับน้องท่าเพลินไซต์ w w w o n e c g o t h โดยเฉพาะข่าวสารที่พาการศึกษาและน้องท่าเพลินได้รวมมือกันให้เพื่อนเพื่อนทั้งเรื่องราวสำคัญและประเด็นเด่นทางด้านการศึกษาที่น่าสนใจเข้าถึงข้อมูลข่าวสารได้ง่ายและทันทุกเรื่องราวอย่ารอช้ามาท่องโลกแห่งการเรียนรู้ไปพร้อมกันกับน้องพาเพลินคลิกเลยเรื่องราวทางการศึกษาพร้อมส่งตรงถึงเพื่อนเพื่อทุกคนแล้วสวัสดีค่ะ as we move on and return to normalcy We look forward to welcoming you to Thailand. To New Zealand 2021 APEC host, you have joined us together to overcome unprecedented challenges. ขอบคุณค่ะ The pandemic has revealed. Imbalances in the way we live, do business, and treat our planet. We must do better for a better future. Together, we can increase regional economic integration. Once again, good afternoon. Uh, first in line in this afternoon's activity is an interactive discussion for economies. To help us moderate this session, let's welcome Dr. Ethel Agnes Pascua Valenzuela, the director of Simeo Secretariat, Bangkok. Mr. Panthev Labgeson, educator, senior professional level from the Office of the Education Council. All right, we also have the members of the panel. Ms. Jen Ben, Dr. Jaya Priya Kasinathan, Dr. Rie Ataki, and I also would like to welcome Ms. Chin Ying Wang and Ms. Wendy Hart, who are joining the panelists online. Thank you. All right, let's give them a big round of applause, please. Thank you so very much. สวัสดีครับ Uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Education, Thailand, uh, as a host of APEC 2022, we would like to welcome you back to the afternoon session of the WUGA World Conference. That's a short nickname for this event. And um, 
also, uh, I would like to remind you that uh, most of the country that are participating online now are on the uh, eastern side of the Pacific Rim, which is the daytime. But on the other side of the Pacific Rim is the nighttime of the fourth, entering the May of fifth. So good evening for you all from the Northern and Central America and Latin America friends. That's the order of the day of today. And uh, may I also uh, invite Dr. Uh, Etel Venezuela, the director of the CMO uh, Secretariat, to join the, uh, the panel uh, as a co-host of, of this session. Could you please uh, say something first? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pantep. And Good afternoon to all of you. I'm very pleased to join uh, Dr. Pantep in this uh, interactive discussion. So we have participants on the floor and also some participants joining us online, our member economies of APEC in 2022. Right. Um, so I think uh, for the benefit of your presence here, madam, uh, we would like to invite uh, representative from three economies who are at present here to give a opening remark first for three to five minutes and then uh, allow some time for our friend by the Zoom system to prepare themselves, especially the friend uh, from Hong Kong, Chinese Taipei, China, the Philippines, and New Zealand. Uh, that that uh, the first notice for the online sprint. So at first, I think uh, it's uh, the turn of the first economy, Australia. I think the first question so far that we would love to hear from uh, ethnic uh, members would be that in APEC strategy 2016 to 2030, if I may recall, in strategy three, it talk about employability, talk about the sustainable way to ensure that our graduates will be in the good uh, transition from school to the workplace. And of course, the concept of the inclusive growth, whereas we don't left anyone behind the process. But from Dr. Fry this morning, uh, just like a tsunami, Sometimes unpredictable things happen in our system, especially in education and skill development. And maybe you can recall a recent development on COVID-19 to with our uh, education system. So what are the measure or systematic thinking of the Australian economies towards the world of VUCA in this uncertainty world. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to speak here today. And I must give a thank you to our generous host from the Ministry of Education, Thailand, and of course to every APEC member economy joining this meeting both in person and from afar. I'd also like to thank this morning's keynote speakers. They certainly motivated some thinking within myself, um, things I'll take back to my everyday job and also panellists and Dr Wang from Ednet for sharing your perspectives on policy implementation and the challenges in a VUCA world. I've got no doubt that the insights shared will help not just me in my day-to-day -day life, but help APEC economies to better understand the policy levers that can be used to support people through education and training, and as you say, Dr Pantip, into employment as we navigate an increasingly uncertain future. It was interesting to reflect this morning that the experience shared mirrored some of the experiences from Australia, both during the pandemic itself, but also the way that our education system has changed and pivoted to provide different types of educational experiences for all Australians. As we focus on recovery from the pandemic, collaboration within and across multilateral fora such as APEC will give us the opportunity to continue to sharpen our focus on the key objectives of education and training and work together to deliver stronger outcomes. 
I thought I'd just use a couple of minutes to share some of the thoughts from Australia um, around our experience in the last couple of years. I think the lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic have certainly demonstrated that our education and training systems need to be resilient enough to support both um, students across Asia Pacific, but most specifically our vulnerable groups. The shift to digital and blended modes of education and training delivery has shown us the transformational value and impact of digitization. But this shift, as others have said this morning, noted that there's a risk of increasing inequality if proper measures are not in place. We've certainly experienced that educational technologies are still developing and governments have a role to play in shaping and encouraging innovative education models that are high quality and easily accessible. During the pandemic, Australia's school systems demonstrated remarkable agility and commitment in adjusting to remote learning conditions. And this is an experience that we look to share more of with member economies. We are very fortunate that most Australian students have continued to receive a high quality education and to progress their learning. We commissioned research early in the pandemic to examine the impact of remote learning on the education outcomes of vulnerable children and the barriers they face in accessing remote education. This work provided evidence-based action that continues to inform our policy to this very day. Australian schools provided vulnerable and disadvantaged students with resources such as laptops, IT equipment and internet access, and options for either online or face-to-face -face learning, in recognition of the fact that students were more likely to experience significant impacts to their learning. I know anecdotally that even in some of our vocational education and training institutions, students were provided with things like bread making kits so they could continue their hands-on learning at home. This experience has demonstrated the role that governments have in putting in place measures to ensure that education remains accessible and equitable. Digitisation provides our education systems with opportunities to deliver new and innovative education offerings reaching new cohorts of learners, accessing new markets, and providing opportunities to upskill, or very importantly in the context of the last two years, reskill in areas of need. This is something that Australia has worked with APEC member economies on over the past few years, and we continue to share our experience in delivering quality online education and training with EdNet. One example is that in 2019, an Australian-led project developed the APEC Quality Assurance of Online Learning Toolkit in collaboration with a range of educational experts across APEC member economies. This toolkit, which we encourage you to continue to use, is a concise guide for developing online learning capabilities with the knowledge of best practice and quality assurance measures. And I can share that just last week in Vietnam, we ran a workshop based on the APEC online toolkit and its nine principles. So we definitely encourage you to use it and we can recently attest to its currency. This year we will commence a new project on addressing skills needs through online micro-credentials. We know that short form training is going to be very important in supporting a labour market pivot and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. This project will build the capacity of APEC economies to deliver online micro-credentials and develop education offerings that can address local skill gaps more quickly and more effectively than longer form traditional education, although not to say that that's not still important. We will deliver three workshops on the design, development and delivery of online micro-credentials in higher education. The workshops will then inform the development of a toolkit which will collate tools, resources and best practice to support the high quality online micro-credentials and we look forward to sharing more information with member economies on this project over coming months. We know that there are other projects that are being proposed by EdNet members of this type and we do look forward to engaging with these projects further throughout the year. Just finally, I'd just like to note this morning that one of our speakers spoke quite a bit about data and having information to inform policy. In the last few years, Australia has developed a National Skills Commission that's working to understand the skills that are needed into the future. By understanding the jobs and skills in demand for current and future labour markets, economies can better support targeted and relevant education and training offerings. 
I won't go into too much detail of the National Skills Commission role here, but we look forward to sharing that information with you over the next week and a little bit. Um, I will stop there. Um, there's some of the experiences that we've had, um, but I look forward to sharing more with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I think um, you have such a good uh, connection, I think, from the Australian uh, experience, how to connect the formal education and the skill development side by putting just like one scenario of the COVID-19, the interruption of uh, education and training in the conventional institution and how Australian uh, uh, overcome those uh, type of barriers. Thank you. I think that would be the good start of, of our discussion. So next we move to our friend just uh, on the other side of the Pacific, which is uh, a tiny, tiny, uh, uh, can, uh, economies, but has a strong outcome in terms of learning and skill. May I invite the representative of Brunei Dalrissalam. Hello and very good afternoon to all and thank you for having um, me here today representing Simi Voktek from um, Brunei Darussalam. So um, as Dr. Pantep said, we are a tiny, tiny, tiny little country. And, <laughs> and um, yes, uh, our experience of uh, COVID-19 has been pretty special because uh, the first wave, it was um, beginning March 2020, and uh, I think uh, till about July 2020, and uh, all of a sudden, we didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, literally, uh, we had to switch from face-to-face -to, -face to going online. Um, but um, somehow or rather, I think uh, most of the schools and also um, vocational training um, institutes um, were already ready with digital um, collaborative, uh, sorry, digital platforms, learning platforms. So the um, transition wasn't too difficult. So we were able to carry on seamlessly. Um, however, yeah, um, uh, coming back to what has been uh, shared with us this morning, I think very, very important key points has been shared. Uh, firstly, I would like to um, point out to equality and inclusion. I think these are two key important things that we need to um, uh, consider when we are developing any policies um, or strategies so that no one is left behind. And I think Professor Fry, um, in his speech, did say that one size does not fit all. So in terms of inclusion, I think we have to see how can we include everyone um, in this journey, so no one is left out. And uh, I think also um, another of our panelists, um, if I'm not mistaken, from the um, United States, who has also talked about how we need to have active dialogues between um, employers as well as the education sector so that we know what are the jobs that are, you know, um, um, in, uh, what, what are the jobs that are there and what are the skills that are needed because skills our um, technologies today become obsolete so fast. And so we continuously need to reskill and upskill. And this, uh, this touches upon capacity building, especially for instructors in uh, perhaps technical colleges and, and so on. And we at Simio, this is our mandate to actually make sure the capacity building of technical in, uh, instructors in the region is up to date. And especially today, I think when we talk about competencies and skills. I think Professor Fry also talked about this. He said, knowledge goes away, but competency and skills always stays with us. And I definitely agree with that. So I think today what we need to see is uh, living in this uh, VUCA world and also the new world of work. Um, there are new skills and competencies that we need in order to make ourselves relevant, in order for us to find suitable employability. And so I think the education sector have to be, you know, very um, up to date in um, ensuring um, these skills are given to learners and also people who are already in employment because these are um, 
we we need to find a way to um, you know enhance their skills and competencies so they are still made relevant yeah and and also i think this morning uh, the, it was said about 12% um, of um, people in the um, APEC economies are um, uh, above, you know, I think they will be 65 soon. So, so how are these, sorry, in the retirement age, so how are we going to, um, you know, give them employment? Um, so we need to think about ways to also um, ensure that um, there are ways that they could uh, earn. Um, besides that, I think uh, what I would also like to say is that um, I think what COVID-19 has taught us is that um, we are never to take anything for granted. And uh, we were actually caught in a um, situation unprecedented, never before seen. And I think that has somehow, although the challenges were um, really uh, much, but at the same time, there's been a lot of opportunities and I think people, and I think a lot of economies have come up with ways of innovation um, in terms of training and education, so that we carry on and uh, we we remain resilient. So I think that is the the, the takeaway of COVID nineteen. So that uh, regardless what happens, we 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 take this as a, a learning and uh, we carry on. And I do hope and pray that we we never see such a uh, you know, situation uh, ever before. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Brunei. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that we will carry on on your thought would be um, the dimension that you just mentioned on how we incorporate everybody is on board uh, in such a very unpredictable uh, circumstance, especially for those who are far behind in terms of socioeconomic uh, status. That would be one of the key message that we would love to, to hear more and more, maybe tomorrow and on the HRDWG next week on that too. Uh, so move next to uh, our friends from the Central Asia, uh, Japan. Uh, what is the circumstance for such a strong economies to confront with unpredictable things, especially post-COVID-19. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Pantep. Um, it is an honor to be here to talk about the Japanese education. However, I've been living in Thailand for more than 20 years. And so I hope I can deliver the best part of Japanese education. Uh, just listening to this morning's talk, it is obvious we're all in the same boat. The world is changing from industry-based society to information-based society. And we all think our conventional way of education may not be appropriate to produce the next generation. So we all think we need to do something about education. We are in the same boat. And this uh, pandemic, Corona, came a couple of years ago, and it changed the whole world for us. And in a way, face-to-face -face learning is changing online. And uh, this kind of parallel session face-to-face -face conference with online is a new thing, but it's becoming normal. And this is online technology is, a, in a way, challenging the, our way of the conventional school system. Do we really need to do this school? Can we change? Or what part can we change? Or should we stick to this conventional way? We all think. Am I doing the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? Is this good for the future? So I think we have lots of questions ourselves, and we are in the same boat. And uh, this morning, Dr. Fry talked about the uh, keynote speaker. I found it very interesting. And when he talked about uh, Japanese education, holistic approach, moral education, 
an ikigai, uh, that's a life worthwhile living. I listen to it with uh, pride, at the same time, embarrassment. We are not that good, <laughs> as it sounds like. Uh, we do have both sides. But anyway, I wanted to talk about just uh, the many aspect level of education we can talk about, but then uh, I'm just focusing, I will focus on basic education in a general stream. In order to cope with the new paradigm shift, Japanese education adopted an integrated approach for the last two, uh, 20 years. Integra integrated approach is in the part of curriculum, in addition to like math, science, or language literature. There is a time lesson period called integrated approach. And that's left to each school. Each school can develop their own curriculum. It's a project-based learning to aim at developing student uh, critical thinking, research skill, collaboration, or problem solving, what you call 21st century skill. That's been in Japanese education curriculum for the last 20 years. Something I'm proud of. However, at the same time, this integrated approach is the target of criticism because you all know PISA, International Comparative Study of like Science, Math, Literature. After 10 years of adopting this integra integrated approach, Japan's ranking went down. We called it the PISA shock. <laughs> we, are never, we are always ranked within the top 10, but then uh, our science went tense, which is still very good. But then for us, being proud of the top three, it was a shock. And uh, many educators criticized because we did this integrated approach, which is kind of wishy-washy. We don't know the standard of the curriculum. Each school developed their own curriculum. We don't know how to evaluate it. And may, we, waste, we wasted time to this thing, and we didn't focus on math, language, or science. So we reduced the integrated approach lesson time increase the basic subject area, which shows our confusion, uncertainty, not confidence enough in what we are doing. So we are kind of going, are we doing OK? Or maybe we better do something else? So we are still in a confusion. But that's the reality. Another thing I wanted to talk about, uh, technology. Now, advancement of technology changed the whole world, not only education. And when you consider Japan, you automatically associate, oh, Japan, high technology. That's, uh, they must be excellent. But they must be excellent in industry, but in a school system, we didn't really use technology. When you look at the comparat international comparative uh, study, digital use in school in Japan is, um, how do I say it? We didn't use it. And now this year, academic year 2021, this is the first year Japanese Ministry of Education considered we need to do something about it. We are proud of technology, but we are so behind in use of technology in school system. And so we implemented a, a project called Giga Project, which is one tablet, one student, for all students at the basic education level. Thailand did that too, which I don't know the result yet. <laughs> but then 
that Thailand did a few years ago, but then this is a, for Japan, who, which you think technology is so advanced. This is the first year we did one tablet per student all over Japan. However, this is a question. Um, do we really need to do it? Are we just doing, using technology for the sake of using technology? Look at the Japanese education, which Dr. Fry, Dr. Fry praised. We did OK before adopting technology. But then why are we doing it? And then policy maker said, oh, we need to catch up with the advancement of technology. But then the teachers at the school, we've done OK. Why do you use technology? This is uh, giving us more work with uh, no clear outcome. Are we really producing the outcome we expect? We don't know. So I'm, I hope I don't sound very pessimistic because we are doing what we believe the best. However, nobody knows whether it's working or not. So I believe the purpose of this kind of a conference to show what we are doing, but then both sides, not just the proud we are doing this, we are doing this to achieve this uh, ideal. Let's be honest and uh, show the both sides, good and bad. Even if we are, we are confused to some extent, but that's okay. This is what we confused. And uh, what kind of outcome, we don't know yet. But then tell us what you are experienced. Tell us uh, what came out. Brunei's uh, case study may not be applicable to Japan, but at least we know some options, diversity. So this is, uh, I'll stop here. But then this is uh, the purpose we are here. Thank you so much. So we have heard from our three panelists here in the hotel, very good ideas on how they meet uncertainties in these most difficult times from Australia, carrying on quality education, and to Brunei, Jerusalem, taking a closer look at those in the margins, the disadvantage, education for everyone, and also from Japan, it's a realization of you know, the utilization of technology and educational system and more. We would be listening to the next panelist who, who joined us online. So we have China, Chinese Taipei, Hong Kong, and are they ready? Next batch of speakers. Oh. Hello, everyone. I'm Yang Hong Tao, Director in Career Development Education Division of Center for Student Service and Development, Ministry of Education, People's Republic of China. I'm very glad to meet you at the Public Education Network Conference. To save your time, my colleague Li Xiaoshu will answer your question in English on my behalf. Hello. We didn't hear you, sorry, sir. We cannot sir. hear you, Mr. Young. Uh, 
Hello. Hi. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yeah. Now clearly. Uh, can you hear Miss Kaya and Mr. Fiber as well? Hello, everyone. I'm Yang Fung Tong, Director in Career Development Education Division of Center for Students Service and the Development Ministry of Education, People Republic. To save your time, my colleague Li Xiaoshu will answer your question in English on my behalf. Mr. Yang, uh, we're requesting your reflections on the sharing on VUCA and how your country is addressing this in terms of education, training, and employability. Thank you very much. Mr. Yang, please. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I think there is some miscommunication uh, in, in terms of the preparing for this interactive discussion. I talked to my Chinese colleagues in the morning and uh, the message that, that they have got for preparing for participating in this session is uh, just the questions, the answers. So they are ready to answer any of the questions from either participants or floor, but uh, obviously they haven't uh, prepared a formal presentation, but uh, uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the how China addressed the challenge of VUCA world, I believe that uh, uh, they could uh, uh, deal with these issues near following question and answers. And uh, as I'm also from China, I'll be ready to share with you too, but uh, uh, we would like to hear first from uh, other member economists. Well, excuse me, Kata. May I suggest we move on to the next panelist? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we would uh, like to call the next speaker from Chinese Taipei. Chinese Taipei, are you here? Good afternoon. And a third speaker is from Hong Kong. So. Uh, could we see our next speakers lined up? Chinese Taipei and Hong Kong, are you with us? Or I'll move to calling the Philippines. Philippines, Dr. Marge Ballesteros, Department of Education, are you with us? Okay, Philippines, uh, Dr. Margarita Ballesteros is the director of the Department of Education International Cooperation Office. Dr. Marge, can you give us your reflections on uh, VUCA and how the government tried to respond in, in terms of education, in terms of training and capacity building, especially during the time of pandemic and uh, how you see the future happening? Thank you, Dr. Marge. 
Um, thank you, Director Ethel. I hope I could be heard. Can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you, Dr. Marge. There is such a thing as when we get to disconnect from calls or from meetings or conferences like this, it would mean that um, we are still part of the world wherein we all face the many challenges, the humongous challenges brought about not only by COVID-19, but of course, of the many disruptions that we human beings have been facing and striving to do well. With this morning's presentations from the keynote to the panel, I would say that Thailand has chosen appropriate topics, especially so that uh, you're working with the education network team headed by China here, uh, a colleague, Dr. Wang Yan. And I would say that when we talk of VUCA here in the Philippines, at this time of the pandemic, we have tried to ride on the waves of also of the challenges brought by COVID with the same or with other countries, as I've heard, uh, Brunei, Australia, and that of, of Japan and Thailand as well. Here in the Philippines during the pandemic, how did we cope with, with COVID? Well, number one, we made use of what technology had to offer. And when we talk about technology, we don't just talk about connectivity to the internet, but also tapping the skilled workers on the ground, be it on the health sector or from the education sector. In terms of, or in the education sector, we did make use, since I come from the Ministry of Education or the Department of Education, we did make use of platforms. We have the DepEd or the Ministry's DepEd Commons, we call it, where parents, learners, and teachers were able to, to uh, get to connect and get materials for their uh, continuous or learning uh, continuity plan. And that is uh, what, what we call the basic education continuity plan as well. So for the health sector, we have our frontliners who made use of technology as well for them to take good care of their patients and victims and cases as well. In terms of the, uh, the, uh, the um, Uh, consumer sector, or we mean the commerce, we did, um, there is this um, humongous challenge on how we can do uh, our e-commerce on the ground. But again, since the, uh, the labor market is so huge, and we have young people on the ground as well, we call them our millennials, the young professionals who are into it, and they were able to navigate with technology again that was not really a, a problem and, and only a challenge for those who really are coping up and trying to, to navigate very slowly but surely with, with the uh, technological advancement. I would like to zero in my sharing this afternoon on what we call um, how the fourth industrial revolution has been or has guided us or redirected our programs in the education sector. Developing countries like the Philippines, we, we know that, the, that responding to the demands of this changing world, there is really a need to respond to pre-existing problems. In the education, one of them would be infrastructure with, and also universal access and addressing learning gaps, which was also mentioned earlier this morning. Catching up with Fort IR, in, take a look at the ICT infra, digital literacy, and of course, global education. There is a need to support teachers as they respond to the call of developing new pedagogies, which Australia has uh, has emphasized early on, we need to continuously upskill and reskill our teaching force. We also need to guide learners as we look into the transformation of education systems, since our citizens, our, our future citizens are our learners, 
at this time of the 21st century. And again, I would like to, to, to emphasize what was mentioned with by our uh, professor this morning who shared that we now call this as a lonely century. And I, I don't need to explain further what it means, considering that with the COVID-19, we have experienced how and what coping, coping mechanisms we should have or what we should imbibe in our learners. And also making education responsive to the needs of the new world, meaning let us also look at how inclusive the education sector is, as mentioned by a colleague and uh, at the Simios, from the Simio Center uh, and representing Brunei Jerusalem in this afternoon's uh, panel. So the VUCA world, is leading us to a transformed education systems as well as labor markets and any other sector for that matter that would contribute, uh, that, that take uh, a part in seeing to it that we don't only live in a sustainable world, but we look at how we can also sustain efforts of all governments together so that the VUCA will not only remain VUCA, but let us now add D in the Philippines. We say VUCA, D is digital. That is why in the region, we are working for the digital transformation of education systems, which Thailand also is part of the, the team. Uh, with that, I end my sharing and reflections this afternoon. Thank you, Thailand, for the wonderful opportunity to share with you this afternoon and to Dr. Wang Yan as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippines. So we have learned a lot about uh, the responses of the government, including the development of their DepEd Commons, the platform to provide education during the time of lockdown and closure, and also continuing on with the responses on Industry 4.0, capacity building, and adding digitalization in the VUCA world. Thank you so much, Philippines. I heard that China, Chinese Taipei, uh, they're already ready. Uh, can we now have Chinese Taipei or China? Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yes, uh, thank you very much, China. Please go ahead. Okay, sorry for the internet error just now. Uh, the main project targets for economic and employment development this year are um, GDP growth of around 5.5%, over 11 million new urban jobs, a surveyed urban unemployment rate of no more than 5.5%. We will strengthen the employment first policy. We will work to broaden the employment channels, promote employment stability by keeping the operations of market entities stable and harnessing the role of being startups in boosting employment. Fiscal and financial policies will facilitate implementation of the employment first policy and greater support will be provided for enterprises. The number of college graduates in 2022 is estimated to reach 10.76 million, some 1.67 million graduates more than the previous year. At present, China economy attaches great importance to employment of college graduates and other important groups. The Ministry of Education made the graduates' employment a top priority. Here, I will introduce some measures we have taken. First, National 24365 Graduate Employment Service Platform. Uh, it has been launched. In order to cover the impacts of COVID-19 on college graduates' employment and solve the practical problems, for example, college students have difficulty in attending in-person job Fears. The Ministry of Education, together with local employment departments, higher education institutions, business, and industries, began to build a professional website in February 2020, which provides a 365 day and 24 hour online campus recruitment service. At present, the website 
has been upgraded and incorporated in the National Smart Education Platform. It is a platform for the online education. And 24365 Employment Platform provides tens of millions of job opportunities for the students. Second, flexible employment is supported. In the rapid development of the digital economy, new employment forms and modes emerged, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. New forms of employment, such as online retails, mobile getting around service, online education training, and online medical care play an important role for social development. Flexible employment has increasingly become the choice of people. We have enhanced the guidance and the training for college graduates, encouraging and instructing them to get a job by flexible employment and strengthening labor rights and the interests protection from the students. Third, the employment guidance service has been improved. Higher education institutions generally set up employment guidance courses with their own features. Higher education institutions organized career planning um, competitions, job hunting training camps, campus recruitment months, and other activities to provide targeted employment guidance for the graduates. The Ministry of Education developed a public leave lesson of internet plus employment guidance, where the nationwide experts from employment guidance agencies, businesses, and industries were organized to provide guidance for the nationwide colleges graduates via live streaming. A total of 95 episodes have been aired with a total audience of 280 million. At the same time, the Ministry of Education launched a public welfare program of national college graduates employability training. The program planned to treat 50,000 people offline and 200,000 online every year by online and offline employability training, helping attendees enhance their confidence to find jobs and improve their employment competitiveness. Both a docking mechanism between higher education institutions and industries has been established. The social and economic development is inseparable from higher education and in the development of higher education should also meet the needs of the society and the economy. In order to promote exchanges and cooperation between higher education institutions and industries and closely integrate in the talent, um, in talent training of higher education with the talent needs of industries and the businesses. The Ministry of Education has established in the National Steering Committee for Employment and Entrepreneurship of College Graduates. The committee is a national nonprofit expert organization with 19 industrial subcommittees, such as Equipment Manufacturing Committee, Agriculture and Forestry Committee, Energy and Power Committee, and etc. Meanwhile, we are carrying out the national special initiative of university presidents visiting businesses, exploring posts, and promoting employment. Presidents actively visit industrial parks, industries, and business, which can not only explore more posts for graduates, but also effectively identify the demands of employers for college talents, so as to improve school running ideas and formulate more scientific talent training plans to better meet the needs of the society and the beings. In the next step, the Ministry of Education will work with other government departments to ensure local authorities and the universities 
effectively implement various employment promotion policies, strengthen departmental leakage and coordination, ensuring the implementation of various employment policies and measures, and make every effort to ensure fuller and higher quality employment for college graduates of 2022. Okay, and that's all about uh, our information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Yang of China. Indeed, we learned a lot from you, your approach, your plans, and your implementation, especially the training and employability. That's really great to connect the two. And uh, you highlighted as well linkages, cooperation, and partnership. This is really very important in this VUCA world. So I uh, would like to find out if we have on floor Chinese Taipei and Malaysia. Let us wait uh, for a few minutes. Malaysia and New Zealand, are you with us? For the audience, you can actually sh share your thoughts in the chat box, those who are joining us online. If you have some questions, we can process them later. And, but and for those of you who are here, yes. uh, we will open the floor to you too. So please think about uh, your personal remarks and maybe some comments or even questions to our yes. friends. So it, that's why we call this term interactive session, whereas both online, offline, on-site, off-site can talk together. Let me check again. Malaysia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Chinese Taipei. Good afternoon to all those who have joined us online. Are you with us to share your reflections and uh, your country experiences in approaching the VUCA environment and the responses or solutions? Do we have them? So while we're waiting for our friend from the Zoom system, uh, should anybody here have some comments or questions that would love to ask both uh, our on-site uh, uh, representative of the economies or even our live friends? มีคําถามที่จะถามมั้ยครับขอประธานโทษที่ไทยภาษาไทยครับผมในระหว่างที่รอเพื่อนที่อยู่ในระบบซูมนะครับ uh, so if not, uh, I think uh, we're going to start a bit on uh, interactive uh, moting of the question with our friends here on site and then with our three uh, economies online that are in the process right now. So I think from my understanding would be that uh, the first thing that we are talking on this conference is would be the transition from school or formal education, it may be compulsory education to the workplace. And then we thought that uh, within NAI, we expect some qualification and skill from our graduates that should meet the needs of the industry. But something happened all along this nine year. And we found out mostly from the entrepreneur and employer, future employers, that the graduate that we have prepared is not the one. And they have to spend another additional two or three years to retrain, reskill, to upskill. That's the, it's the thing before Wuga. And then Wuga comes. The complexity would be, <clears throat> you know what? I don't even know what I'm doing. So what is the, the compromise way for educators and skill developers? On one hand, we know that in compulsory education nine years, it's far too long to expect the outcome. 
But on the other hand, on the entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur side, they are adapting for the new skill, as Dr. Rie just mentioned. Technology changes, things have changed. So what is the compromise way for the, the policy makers, for the school administrator, or for even teacher or parents in this circumstance? So which one that you uh, would like to address first? Okay, I'll have a, a first start at that question and I don't think there is one answer. <laughs> I think it is a, a complex set of answers, but perhaps just sharing a little bit from, from the extra Australian experience. Um, and as you, you noted, Dr Pantip, I think it isn't um, necessarily an issue that's been brought about by the past two years. It's been an issue for a number of years um, and the pandemic has somewhat accelerated the issue, but certainly wasn't the cause of it. Uh, a couple of things that we've been looking at within the Australian system, and I talked about them a little bit in the introduction, is the role, uh, of course, there will always be a place for, for long form qualifications. Um, uh, you know, you cannot be a doctor if you don't do a certain length of study. Um, likewise, if you're an engineer, um, a lawyer, um, uh, a chef, um, other types of qualifications, um, will be needed, um, but there will be other um, workplace skills that are not necessarily, do not necessarily require that long form training. So one of the things that Australia has been working uh, quite actively on for the past few years has been the place of what we call short form training or delivery of micro credentials within our system that are accredited or non accredited, but that have a formal role to play within our system so that graduates who may find that they need an additional set of skills to participate in a certain job role are able to gain those skills through the delivery of a micro-credential. That micro-credential might be delivered face-to-face, -face, it might be delivered online. That's the mechanism, but the content is within some form of short-form training. Um, so that's something that um, continues to be reformed within the Australian system, both in higher education and in vocational education and training. Um, but that reform has been taking place for a number of years. Um, we also had some work done a few years ago that looked at the role and place of micro-credentials within our qualifications frameworks. That, that piece of work is not yet complete, um, but it is an interesting piece of work to follow. I think the other thing that we can share from our experience, particularly with a focus on vocational education and training, is how qualifications themselves are framed and developed. Um, so qualifications within Australia's vocational system have been developed into training packages or collations of qualifications that are quite strongly um, prescribed and training institutions need to deliver those tr against those training packages. We've undertaken quite the journey of reform to our skill system over the past few years and continue to do so. And one of the reforms that we're looking at is whether or not we can um, provide a slightly more flexible approach to vocational education and training by having industry clusters develop training packages that aren't quite as tightly prescribed, that allow vocational um, graduates to have a broader set of skills and then some narrow skills that will enable them to participate more flexibly um, and be more agile within our um, labour market. So they're just a couple of things that I think are important in the context of your question um, from the Australian perspective that we continue to work through. I'm sure there's other things as well that I'm neglecting to talk about. Um, what I'm going to say may not be representative of Japanese education. It could be just a personal opinion, but I would like to share it. Uh, you mentioned about like, from basic education to like a TZ and all. But then uh, I think it is a question for all educators. What is education? What is the role of school? Are we producing workforce or are we producing human being for the next generation. What is our responsibility? That is a very fundamental question. 
when we talk about the producing workforce, okay, skills need to be upgraded. Uh, our conventional way is not catching up with the current industry. But then, uh, is that our role as educators? I was glad when Dr. Fry mentioned Japanese education focused on a holistic approach, and I was very proud of it. Because as an educator, I thought we are producing a human being, not the workforce. But then uh, when you look at the higher education, university is not the ivory tower anymore. We can't just think about what is life in the ivory tower. You got to have a skill, technical skill to be uh, instantly used for the company. Is that what we are trying to do. I think when we talk about what should I do, how to do it, before answering those questions, I think we have to ask why, what are we, edu what are we educators trying to do in our school system? Right. So from the Brunei perspective, um, I would like to say from the vocational and technical um, education, um, we're quite proud to say that the employability is about 70%. So I think there is something right that we're doing in the education system. But nevertheless, answering to your question, um, as a moderator, is that I think um, there should be, as I've said before, very active um, uh, dialogue um, interaction between um, employers as well as the education sector and uh, this needs the curriculum needs to be reviewed at least every six months or one year to see what is in need and that needs to be added and taught, taught to the students in my personal experience whenever I've sent you know uh, I've been an educator for the past 20 years and when I've sent my uh, uh, students for internship and I would ask them a question so uh, among the, 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 the you know, subjects that you have studied, which do you apply most? And they would just look at me. So <laughs> they would not understand that every, it, it's holistic learning. You, know, you can't just pick one or two. It's everything. It's a combination of everything that comes into play when you go to work. And until I think someone steps into the actual workplace, only then you realize uh, what you need or what you lack. So then again, I think getting feedback from students and having very um, strong internship uh, programs is very important to make sure that the employers would get the kind of skills that they're looking for, and that will make our students um, employable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you like to comment on this? Uh, China and the Philippines? If not, uh, can we have some comment from here? Okay. Uh, Pante, I'm again here this morning from Kamnabit Science Academy. And actually, I have been discussing my friend here from Silabakon University. I think she has uh, some input in there. I think she'd like to share with you, right? Yeah. Sorry. Um, I'm Warren Yupun, so from uh, assistant for, to the president of uh, Silicon University. I have some experience um, about the uh, education system in, in my experience. Um, right now, everything changes rapidly. So what happens is students, you know, they have their favor for some certain career. Uh, trending and then the demand side of the industry can be different so it's kind of imbalance between those demand and supply somehow um, you know like right now uh, most of the students would like to be a blogger or whatever that that they have um, kind of you know, their favor so balance between requirement from the 
country, from the industry, and your, uh, the student favorite. This is something that we have to uh, think about and try to uh, do the balance between these two. So the student come to the university with pay attention for what they're looking forward to. Um, this is going to be something that I think is going to be promising because of, I would like to go and teach and then students have a starry eye that they know what they're really learning and then what they want in life and in career. So this is something I think is we have to think about how to make the uh, strategy curriculum that support both balance between industry and their student life. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very, very uh, good intervention from Thailand. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So I think I, I have seen here that Philippines is ready. Uh, Dr. Marge, would you like to comment on this? Let's try again. So and right now, many of our participants are actually multitasking, you know, this is the century we're in. But Dr. Marge, having a lot of meetings, we call on you to give your reflection on the question posed by Dr. Pantep on, you know, the, the attributes of graduates and actually how they can be more employable and the mismatch that we see as given by our, uh, you know, uh, panelists and also our audience here. So what is, what is the uh, reflection from your side in the Philippines in terms of our graduates and employability? Dr. Marge? Good afternoon again. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Ethel. When we talk of the characteristics of our young professionals who are joining the Department of Education, uh, uh, being the part of the uh, selection board committee, we don't only look at the requirements that we, we would like to, we would like to um, look into the resumes and all that, but uh, we also look at the attitude, that's one. Because when we, when we see, we, we, we see that very, uh, very obviously to our young people that they are confident they if you see that as well in thailand we see young people who's got who've got the confidence when they they express their views and all that but one is young people who are joining um the 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 industries even ministries of education this time at this uh era are those who are who exude confidence to what they are, number one, what they are, who they are, and secondly, the kind of of of, of representation they 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 have they have meaning what kind of degrees, what content area are in are they into? So uh, these young people, young professionals who sh who should possess this kind of of characteristics that having that confidence and being able to articulate the the content area they have been trained into in their in the past uh, in their trainings in their universities or in their colleges those two alone would tell us that they would be able to navigate the VUCA world because if you see the attitude that they have this kind of of wanting for more knowledge wanting more to understand we we could see that indeed they the the direction is clear that they would like to to harness the skills that they do have and as as employers we also have to do our part and we invest in them especially on when we are to develop young and future leaders of of the country that's just my thought from my end thank you Thank you very much, Dr. Marge. So we see that because we are in the VUCA world, so we see a lot of change, especially from the young kids. No? They uh, change their careers as, as often as possible, and it seems that we could not keep them. But uh, I would also like to have some views from our APEC EdNet coordinator, Dr. Yang. Would you like to you know, contribute to the discussion? Ma'am, please. 
Uh, well, first of all, I uh, agree with what March has commented. We are living in the uh, we are living in the VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Uh, all the economists represented uh, at the, today's conference have gone through quite similar challenges to battle against the COVID-19. And now, again, the challenges of recovery, economic recovery and the social well-being. So I was wondering, uh, uh, no matter it's about the, uh, the providing the more employment opportunities for tertiary graduates and also for all the labor force, and also in terms of coping with the challenges in the post COVID-19 era. Uh, I was wondering perhaps we can have some solution. I'm trying to coin this word and I'm sure, I'm not sure if you will like it or not. For example, now we have VUCA. Can we have something like a RAPO? Is that RAPO or POWER solution? What, what POWER please allow me to explain. The first is uh, RAD representing uh, uh, or Power P representing uh, perseverance, like all the economists, everybody persevered all the difficulties and the challenges or hardships during COVID-19, also in post-COVID-19 era. And that's first perseverance. And the second is, uh, 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 well, uh, A representing agility. And I really think like, Agility is uh, the solution to all those complicated, complex problems we are facing today, and uh, we need to be more agile in our institutional structure. And we need to be more agile in our resource mobilization. We also, need to be more agile in all approaches and strategy for collaboration to cope with new challenges. And then, third one is uh, uh, resilience. So, resilience that means. We, we need to find new uh, solutions and be flexible and recover from whatever frustrations or uh, the, the problems that, uh, caused, uh, that were caused by the challenge. And last one is, oh, is open-minded. So either for economy or a country that should be keep on opening up and like the policy adopted by China or in terms of uh, individual level, that our person needs to be open-minded to keep on learning new knowledge and skills and competences, engage in real lifelong learning to keep on upskilling and reskilling and to get ready for the labor market. So these are my suggested solutions to the VUCA. That is, uh, I'm not sure which one do you prefer, RAPO or PARA? So PARA solution for VUCA world. That's my comments. Thank you very much. That's really very good. Uh, the solutions that you have proposed, uh, we can relate to that. Perseverance, agility or adaptability, resilience, and open-mindedness. I think we really uh, have seen over the two years we were in the, the pandemic, and we are still in this uh, pandemic. And uh, we see a lot of resilience. We see a lot of adaptability, flexibility, as well as open-mindedness to do uh, more than what you are more comfortable at. Like many of us have transitioned from the traditional educational system to uh, more open and more diverse, hybrid, flexible learning systems. And uh, one thing we learned from our panelists this afternoon is about employability. So we talk about the 21st century skills. So in our region, in Simeo, Southeast Asian Ministers of Education Organization, uh, even a decade ago, we have already adopted 21st century skills in the curriculum from SPN 21, from Brunei, Jerusalem, Malaysia, even as far as Vietnam and Timor-Leste. For 21st century, in terms of communication, in terms of critical thinking, logical, thinking in terms of teamwork, working with others, living together. These are very important skills of graduates. And one thing more, it's like Dr. March said, attitude. When we hire, uh, some companies are no longer looking at the degrees, but actually some are open in terms of uh, what this person is bringing to the company. 
the ideas, you know, critical thinking, innovation, you look at the contributions beyond the academic degree. So uh, in our region as well, we promote training, we promote uh, internship, cross-training. So since 2016-17, we had exchange of students in higher education, in teacher education, and TVET, CTVET. And we have seen that our students would really like to learn and do internship in another country within the region. And even beyond the region of Southeast Asia, we also exchange with Japan uh, and, and the others. Korea also is very active in uh, exchange program with many of our countries. So we learned a lot that you know, in terms of, of education, in terms of training and employability, although we are in the VUCA world, we manage somehow, we adapted and we adjusted and we are so flexible. Dr. Pantep, do you have uh, another question or uh, you want to contribute to the discussions? Thank you. I think we're almost at the last part of our uh, uh, discussions. So Dr. Pantep, would you like to throw the, <laughs> the final one? Well, uh, it has some comments from the floor uh, in writing, so let me uh, uh, read uh, the comment. Um, uh, this person asserts that the drive, some, one of the driving force of the VUCA world is the power of the woman for um, uh, employability. So the role of the women in the society as a driving force of the economy are uncertain somehow, just because somewhere, somehow, they are uh, out of education system and the uh, continuing skill development. That would be one comment. The, the second thing would be that the, the equity side of the story, whereas somebody is not equal to uh, the majority of the society, they need some uh, safety net to elevate their status of, uh, of employabilities and future works, not talking about the, uh, the opportunity on formal education that they should have been developed since the early age. So uh, they, this person would love to uh, uh, put the remarks on how we can improve the law of women as part of uh, the capacity building in the VUCA world. That would be one of the comments from the floor. So I think uh, we still have time to open the floor for friends here to make some comments or even ask some questions from, especially from five remaining economies, both on-site and online. เอ่อสมณะสมาชิกนะครับที่อยู่ในห้องเอ่อมีข้อคําถามหรือคอมเมนต์สไลด์ที่อยากจะเอ่อแสดงณจุดนี้มั้ยครับเรามีเวลาประ
to be agile, how we can uh, empower our schools that they can respond very quickly, how they can uh, think out of the box that along with the curricula and standards that they have to meet during the pandemic, how they can deliver the learning to our uh, underserved students who lack the access to technology. And I think uh, at Simo Summit, we have tried to implement uh, career academies. It's a, it's a model that we need to mobilize resources from private sector to mobilize their capacity to strengthen uh, our school capacity because for our teachers to be able to think out the box, I think they need to learn that how the knowledge can be applied to the real world because the, when coming to the application of the knowledge to the real world, I think the employers sector can contribute a great deal. And if we can have a kind of a structure, a mechanism that our teachers can be able to, to apply the knowledge, to learn how to apply the knowledge to the real world in order that they can organize the learning to our young people. So, in my view, if, uh, if the policy makers can think about a policy that the employment sector can participate in education sector in a structured way, in order that the curricula can be better respond to the real world, because the curricula might be very rigid uh, to the change, and by involving the private sector in the curricula development, in the teacher development, and most importantly, to the certification of our students. So professional standards, uh, so professional certification in ICT, in the healthcare, in uh, agriculture can be introduced to the education sector in order that our young people can acquire the competencies that better respond to the real world. So I, uh, that's my view uh, as a, uh, a solution or position that how we can better respond to the VUCA world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simeo Stem Ed. Uh, that's a, also a very good sharing. And uh, I'm not sure whether we still have some uh, maybe some uh, online questions on the chat box. So uh, while we are waiting for more comments, uh, may I ask some staff on uh, the con uh, yeah. online chat box to check whether or yeah. not they have some additional question uh, uh, from at this point. But may yes, I Professor Fry. Uh, We've been mentioning you from <laughs> the start, but we would like to listen to you. Did we get your points or you want to <laughs> share some more? <laughs> Thank you, Doc. I was very, very pleased that somebody mentioned about the having internships in Brunei or internships in uh, Philippines. And some of you, or many of you may remember Dr. Surin, the former foreign minister of Thailand, then he was a very dynamic uh, leader of uh, the ASEAN region. He was the Secretary General of ASEAN in Singapore, based, uh, based on, no, Indonesia, I think. But anyway, he was for five years, and he had a vision. And he had this wonderful vision to create a ASEAN cooperation core, working together. I talked about... <coughs> benevolent, skillful, skillful communities collaborating. So Dr. Surin's vision, because he benefited personally so much from having been an AFS student in Minnesota, from having been taught by a Peace Corps volunteer. He was a very humble background Muslim in southern Thailand. Two PhDs from Harvard. Went from being a, a poor Muslim, low class in southern Thailand to be Minister of Foreign Affairs in Thailand 
Secretary. So he wanted to have this ASEAN Cooperation Corps so these students could go to different countries in ASEAN, develop soft skills, intercultural competence, develop the kind of 21st century competencies would make them in this kind of VUCA world so agile, I like the use of the word agile and agility from our Chinese colleague, then <clears throat> wouldn't that be a wonderful way to contribute to this new vision? <clears throat> Some people say, oh no, we can't have an ASEAN, there's no money. Well, that's ridiculous. Singapore has money, Brunei has money, uh, Thailand's uh, royal family has money. There's money, that's not a problem, but back to implementation. So I hope while I'm still walking, while I'm still walking and have not walked on, I will see an ASEAN Cooperation Corps and maybe an ASEAN University. Thank you very much, Professor. We really have started with all our intra-ASEAN and even ASEAN-European exchanges, and it's going on very well. Uh, I'm also a beneficiary of an exchange program in the U.S., and I really learned a lot uh, looking all, uh, all and visiting all the top universities, and it has given me a lot of ideas on higher education in the 21st century. And I think this is why we are supporting uh, our career academies, or we are supporting our exchanges, and increasing, and now we're introducing the virtual mobility. <laughs> because we cannot do face-to-face -face mobility, we have invested on a platform where our students can still do internship in other countries and with industries, but in virtual way. So we have started that one. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we are uh, on the right track, right, Professor? And I have one more uh, intervention from the floor. Sir, please. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to direct to Ajahn Pante. Um, initially, you mentioned that lots of companies now complain that graduates uh, didn't have much skills uh, when they enter their company. Uh, I heard that comments a lot too, and I think my colleague here also uh, heard a lot of comments like that. But when I think about this, uh, as an instructor of chemistry myself at the university before retirement, I have heard that comments all the time. But then I think, are we talking about educating people now, we, we used to have this term, sign literate, computer literate, and so on. So when we teach chemistry, we cannot train them, all of them, because we don't know whether they're going to work with batteries company, polymer companies, or water treatment, and so on. So we, we treat them, the knowledge of chemistry, hoping that, when they encounter any problems or any task they have to do, they can adapt their experience and knowledge to do that. I think education needs to be like that. We are not like a training for a specific job because we don't know what kind of job they are going to have in the future. So I think in response to, you to that, I, I like to, uh, to think about we train people to be, uh, have good knowledge in the discipline, to be able to apply to whatever they are going to encounter in the future. Thank you. So, um, it comes right down to the adaptability skill or the art of the surviving of the, the future generation that we are hoping for that uh, in any education system or even skill development can develop those kinds of uh, literate uh, workers or lo workforce, whereas a human soft side has to be developed as a human and a friendly uh, uh, society members that would be the, the trend that many economies try to, to, to discuss and to develop. I think we need the parting words. Yes, <laughs> Dr. Pantep. Yeah, you have given us a lot of ideas. Actually, after this, we will be crafting and drafting some recommendations for the uh, APEC meeting. But I still see Mom, uh, Dr. Yang who would wish to say something. Uh, 
would like to give you a chance to give us your uh, remarks, please. Dr. Young, APEC Education Net Coordinator. Uh, <clears throat> I would just like to uh, echo the comments and the questions addressed to Mr. Pansap. Uh, well, uh, I agree with uh, the speaker, I'm not sure about your name, that it's a universal challenge almost across not only Asia Pacific region, but across the world that uh, the employers are trying to look for the right skills, the people with the right skills and, and the talents. Well, there are many people, millions of them they, on the labor market are looking for the ideal employers. So people attribute this to sometimes to uh, to to the uh, uh, the gap in the education sector, but actually to me this is uh, the gap uh, should be attributed to both the demand and the supply sector. So only through the academia industry collaboration, especially by uh, restructuring and reforming the education and skill systems. In many economies, this is the responsibility of the TVET. But in many more economies, now the boundaries between the education and the skill training are getting merged. Well, according to the most recent statistics, uh, the uh, International Labor Organization, uh, the almost 50% uh, of the jobs in this world will be changed. That means, uh, and also according to the, their statistics, almost everybody needs to go through either reskilling or upskilling at some point of their life to get ready for re-employment or getting into another track of the career. So uh, I, I believe that uh, the mission of educators, no matter where we are, uh, there are three essential or fundamental things. The first is the generic knowledge and skills. That means anyone who graduated from a school at whichever level of education, particularly at the perhaps undergraduate, needs to be well-trained with a good foundation of knowledge and skills. The second, I think the most important, but sometimes that is, could be undermined or, or uh, uh, by by the teaching to test is the uh is the uh, uh is the uh the te teaching to test is to uh ignite and sustain the students learning passion and then the last but not least is the uh we we teach the students uh methodology of learning so learn to learn and together with them, there are many other uh, things like uh, learning to be or learning to collaborate, etc. But I think these are most essential things for for us to, uh, as the educator or people who work in the education world. Uh, that is, uh, they to give students the foundational knowledge and the skills. The second is to to uh, ignite uh, and also to sustain their learning passion for lifelong, and then. Uh, the learning methodology is very important. So that's my, my comments, also my response to the question. Thank, Thank you. you very much, uh, Dr. Yang. I, I really like uh, that, as well as, I will never forget your recommendations on Paro. <laughs> we, we've been discussing about this. Uh, however, uh, Dr. Pantepi, would you like me to uh, continue on with a little summary and then pass on to you? Okay. So uh, this afternoon session, we have seen that many of our economists in APEC have tried to do resetting. It's a reset mode. It's a circuit breaker mode for many of the countries during the pandemic. And despite this VUCA environment that our countries have been living, they're striving, they were able to manage digitalization, uh, transition from the traditional mode of learning to what we call as digitalized learning, hybrid, and uh, all of those, all of the above. And in that context, many of the economists have combined face-to-face -face, uh, teaching and also modularized teaching and even online modalities. So it's a multimodal world during the VUCA and during COVID uh, situation. 
But the thing that we have observed based on the discussions and presentations that, is that they were able to adapt, they become more agile, they're more flexible, and they were able to you know, think better with a newer vision and of course, newer solutions. So they did not stop, they did not give up. What they did is to think of innovation solutions, reaching the margins, reaching the unreached, and those who are in the border. So I think uh, many things that we can recommend to the, the leaders of APEC is uh, actually continue on with innovation, sustaining what we gained from this uh, experience of COVID, and then continue further analyzing the suggestions. Uh, are we producing generalists? Are we producing human beings? Are we producing specialists? Let's continue with the discussions. And then together, I think, we can also further partnership and collaboration between and among our member states, continue on with cooperation, partnership, exchanges, youth exchanges, young leaders conferences, so that we will together understand one another for a better society. So if we have a common vision and if we have common understanding, and if we continue to partner together, these are our recommendations, Dr. Pantep which we hope we can write well <laughs> for the leaders meeting. So I, I would like to thank our panelists. You have given us a lot of things to think about, many good ideas. And also those who have joined us online, thank you so much for all of those uh, you know, contributions, reflections, and suggestions. Thank you. Dr. Pantep, now over to you. Yes, um, if we go to New Zealand right now, it's almost nine. I attend the bedtime. So for those at the very far end of the Pacific, good night. And for the very close friend, good afternoon. And we return the floor to the MC. See you tomorrow. All right, let's give them a big round of applause, everybody. And I think this wrap up our afternoon session. And once again, we highly appreciate your presence and for sharing your perspective on our first day of the conference. Thank you so much, everybody. And we will be seeing you tonight for the welcome dinner at 5.30 here at the Infinity Room. Thank you, and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you very much, and for today. สวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีครับ